Hello and welcome to this video on the California drought. So this is a case study that we've studied during the weather hazards and climate change topic, which is part of the physical geography paper in the Edexcel GCSE geography exam. So thinking about drought and why we study it as part of this GCSE, we need to look at the specification here. 2.8, the impacts of and responses to drought vary depending on the country's level of development. So we're particularly interested on how the impacts of drought on people and ecosystems can vary for a name developed and emerging or developing country. And also how different responses to drought from individuals, organizations and governments in a named developed and an emerging or developing country. So with the California drought, this covers our named developed country, okay? So California is in the country of the USA, which can be categorized as a developed country. Okay, a little bit of quick recap before we actually look at the impacts and responses during the California drought. Which is the best definition for the term drought? A, a period of low to no rainfall. B, a place that is arid. C, a prolonged period of abnormally low water supply leading to a shortage of water. D, a prolonged period of abnormally high water supply leading to an excess of water. Which is the best definition? Have an answer in your head in three, two, and one. Okay, everyone should have got answer C. Okay, so low water supply might be caused by low rainfall, lakes or reservoirs or rivers that are low and drying up, or where the river flow has decreased. Okay, so prolonged, remember, just means longer than normal. And abnormal means un some like unusually doesn't fit a pattern. Okay, so thinking about some of the causes of drought that we would have looked at during our lessons. Deforestation, human or physical? Have an answer in your head in three, two, one. That one's human again. So the building of dams and reservoirs, human or physical? That's human. Remember, you can actually trap water upstream and this is going to prevent more water coming downstream. That's a particular issue if it crosses national borders, if the river crosses national borders. OK, very little rainfall, human or physical. That's physical. Remember, this is probably going to be a meteorological cause of drought. Human or physical, low river levels. That would be obviously that could be human with the dams but if it happens naturally then that's physical and it could be a hydrological cause of drought human or physical farming in agriculture so that one is human okay the water is less likely to be able to be intercepted via vegetation if that space has been made for grazing cattle Okay, last one, El Nino, human or physical? That one is physical. Okay, so El Nino, remember, when we've normally got an area where there is low pressure and an area of high pressure, those two places switch over. So here in Australia, that would normally be where we get really a lot of low pressure, so it's rainy and windy most of the year. However, during an El Nino year, that actually switches to the other side, of the Pacific Ocean, meaning that we get areas of low pressure in South America and we get areas of high pressure in Australia and Indonesia where it would be normally low pressure. Okay, and this can be a common cause of drought in some places across the world. Okay, so thinking about those places that are more most at risk from drought. Okay, so I've, I've put here a, the global distribution of arid climates. Remember, an arid climate is somewhere that's particularly dry. It gets less than 250 millimeters of precipitation every year. So we can see on this map that most of the arid climate is distributed a, across the 30 degrees north latitude line and 30 degrees south latitude line. So arid climates generally found 30 degrees north or south of the equator. Now we know from, from studying the global atmospheric circulation model that 30 degrees north and south is where we get lots of high pressure. So that air is sinking, okay, which means we can associate areas of high pressure that are, that are dry 
and calm conditions and that area of high pressure sits between the Hadley and Ferrell cells. So if you're unsure of that concept, then go back to the global atmospheric circulation model that you've studied. And there's also a video on our YouTube channel for you to catch up on that bit. Okay, so that means that these arid climates are situated across these parts of the globe. Obviously, we have anomalies. All right, so these arid climates generally people who live near them or in arid regions are more at risk from drought because water is already a really limited resource. Okay, so any decrease in water supply means that the impacts are going to be more severe. All right, so California is actually situated in a really arid climate. Okay, so an arid climate looks like areas that have low levels of rainfall and have little vegetation and short growing seasons okay so we have an arid climate here an arid climate here now this one this is not an arid climate this is an arid climate this is also an arid climate you can see vegetation growing in the last one this isn't an arid climate okay now going back to this map we can see that distribution of arid climates and California is actually situated in this purple circle here. Okay, so you can see that part of that state is very arid. Okay, here's our map of the North America. California is this state, the Pacific Ocean to its west. Okay, and here you can see the Sacramento Valley, San Jaguin Valley, and it extends out into the Nevada desert there. Okay, so the California drought. Let's look at some of the factors that caused drought in this area. Okay, so between 2011 and 2017, California experienced one of its worst droughts on record. At the end of 2011, California experienced some of its lowest amounts of precipitation recorded since 1985. Okay. During the summer months of 2012, temperatures were higher than normal, especially in parts of Southern California. From December 2012 to February 2013, California received below average winter precipitation in those regions which were struggling the most. Okay, so this was actually recorded in 2018 on this map, and you can actually see how the majority of the land in California was experiencing below average amounts of rainfall. Okay, so this this shading here on the left shows there was minus one to minus five in some places in California. Okay, in 2013 alone, there was less rainfall in the state than in any other year on record. Okay, that's going to contribute to a drought occurring. Okay, this map here shows how um different areas became categorized as having either abnormally dry or exceptional levels of drought okay so the darker the red the more extreme the drought was okay and this is actually a chloropref map and if you want to understand um, how chloropref maps work then you can go to our youtube channel and there's a short video on that over there okay so this is showing you between july december july 20 December the 31st, 2013 to July the 29th, 2014, how the scenario of drought changed using that shading. Okay, so what were the impacts on the people of this drought? Well, California has a large agricultural industry. So people, a lot of people work in farming. Around 80% of human water usage is from farmers. If there are shortages, farmers' crops will die and there will be less suitable land to plant crops leading to food shortages. Around 17,100 farmers lost their jobs as a result of the drought. Prices of fresh fruit and vegetables rose by 6% as farmers' crop yields fell, but there was a higher grape harvest due to the sunny conditions. So some crops could grow really well, but most of them, tomatoes and broccoli, which accounts for about 90 to 95% of the USA's entire production of those crops in California, they were actually unable to grow as well. And because the demand was still there, the prices of those crops grew. What were some of the impacts on the environment? Well, groundwater stores became depleted due to the overuse of water by farmers. 
and between 2008 and 2011, parts of the Central Valley subsided by around 60 centimetres. That led to damage of bridges, properties and roads. What are some of the impacts on ecosystems? So when vegetation dries out, it becomes a better fuel for fire. The number of wildfires increased significantly during the drought period in California. In May 2014 alone, there were more than 12 wildfires in just one month. Rivers were close to fishing because young salmon weren't able to survive in the warmer waters. They required cool running water to survive and breed. Okay, so we've looked at some of the impacts that a drought can have in a developed country. Now we need to look at how individuals, organisations and governments responded. Have a little read through those examples I've given you here. Okay, so how did individuals respond? Well, there was a 25% increase in the purchase of groundwater pumps, like those seen in the picture on the right, by farmers. Up until 2020, so this year, there were no official rules in place to stop the pumping of water from the ground. Pledge 20 encouraged people to cut their personal water use by 20% in order to prevent water scarcity. How did organisations respond? Well, Save the Fund Bay funds projects throughout the state to provide resilience against drought. So it's trying to prevent those impacts being so severe, including reducing water waste by fixing leaks and using water resistant plants on lawns. The Los Angeles Department of Water and Power placed 96 million plastic shables into the LA Reservoir. That's what we can see happening on, in this photo on the right. And this was in order to reduce evaporation rates. So the amount of water that was turning from a liquid into a gas due to the increased temperatures. However, to actually make these balls, water is required. Okay, so you can actually see what some of the pros and cons of these shade balls are. Government response. So after declaring a statewide emergency in January, the governor provided $25 million for food and $21 million for farmers to try and help them through this testing time. The state increased groundwater pumping to replace surface water loss, costing them $454 million. So a lot of water is actually stored under the ground in California. And you can actually see how this has changed from 2002 all the way to 2014 in this map. Okay, So this green is showing you how much water is stored originally underground. And then the more red it becomes means there's less water stored there. So it's actually drying up. Finally, laws were introduced which forbid restaurants putting water on the table unless it was requested. Other legislation requires cities and water districts in California to report their water use each month. Okay, so we actually want to start assessing that response. Okay, so how did it prevent death? How did it prevent loss of, loss of crops? And was it effective at doing that? We can think about it in the short term. So originally in how it's actually going to impact in the long term, how is it going to um, help people if another drought comes along in the future and whether this is a is a strategy that can be implemented for the whole country if it experiences similar similar drought conditions okay so copy out that diagram you can add your own ideas i've put in here farmers purchase of groundwater pumps so that's actually going to cause farmers to just pump more natural sources of water from under the ground and once that water is gone they're going to have no access or they're going to have a real shortage and not going to be able to water their crops. So that's only a short term strategy and it's not going to be very effective. Okay, have a go on that on your own. You might want to take three minutes to copy that out and assess those responses on your own. Pause the video in three, two, one. Okay, so you should have had a go at that. Last thing I want you to do is I want you to think what the most effective response was and give a reason why take two minutes to do that this is your own idea your own opinion but you need to explain it to ensure that you're justifying why that response was the most effective pause the video in three two one okay and here i've given you an example of what i've written and what I think, I think the most effective response is the work continuing to happen by Save the Bay is because they put forward and work on projects that help save money and better balance the demands of water usage across the state. So they're having good impacts economically and they're also trying to prevent water shortages in the future. And they also work to restore and preserve ecosystems. So it's having a positive impact on the ecosystems in the area as well. Okay, so that's a little information on the California drought.